Okay, here we are. Um, day one of baseball season coming up. Uh, what's up, everybody? Goldie here, and we're going to be talking some MLB DFS. Let's do it. Um, really excited for the season. Uh, today is Wednesday, um, so we're trying to get this out uh, a little bit early for you guys to kind of digest. Um, now, f as far as... Uh, projections and everything go um sheets i believe has his up on the site already uh if not we're just kind of working through some technical difficulties uh on the back end uh and they should be available um you know shortly uh as for my projections just a disclaimer uh i suppose that uh the early part of the season here <clears throat> we're going to i'm only going to be putting up uh drafting stuff um, FanDuel changed some stuff on me, so I've basically got to uh, do a lot of stuff on the back end um, to account for all of that, and well, I'm hoping to to have all that fixed as soon as possible, but uh, really no ETA on, on that just yet. Um, but in the meantime, we will have everything set up for DraftKings, the same thing in in the same manner that we do for golf and and that we did for, uh, for football. So... Um, Really looking forward to to baseball again. Uh, it's been a really interesting off season, and naturally some guys have changed some teams. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the a lot of starting rotations are still intact. A lot of the lineups are still intact. So I can really use a lot of the data from last year to um, at least for the early part of the season give us a a, a decent base. Uh, from where to start, or from which to start, I suppose. So, um, you know, that said, uh, quickly, with the sort of projections, housekeeping type of stuff uh, out of the way, um, my projections may not be available on the site quite yet. Uh, like I said, we're, we're still working uh, on some things in the background. So I'm going to go over here uh, what we've got for the 11-game slate on opening day. Um Probably not going to go over, at least for now, the three-game night slate, I believe, um, that the sites are running. If we do, uh, might put that up just for premium subs. Um, but for the broader public, I think we're going to do, uh, you know, put up this this first uh, main slate sort of first look. Um and kind of give you guys an idea as to how I would like to approach uh, MLB and the videos this season. Uh, for those of you that watch football, uh, watch some of the stuff uh, from me for football season, um, I'll pretty much go through a lot of the same process, right? We'll just kind of get an overview, get our bearings a little bit for each one of the games, um, and and then we'll really go into... Uh, kind of the meat of, of everything, right? Um, so we'll we'll break down spots and 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 pricing and and data and stats and I mean we got all kinds of goodies here. Um, we'll we'll go through all kinds of nonsense. So um, you know I have a, a matchups sort of page as well that I'll probably spend a good bit of time on um, when we're digging into baseball. Uh, it's a bit more fundamentally heavy than just using raw projections for the other sports. I know, um, I mean, that's not to say that uh, projections uh, are not valuable, but really the key to winning in baseball is um, coupling the fundamental analysis and, and data that we have for all of these guys uh, and, and the large sample sizes that we have, coupling all of that with uh, really strong ownership projections, which we do provide at, at TrueDFS as the um, the industry aggregates, right? So we should be able to get a pretty good pulse as to uh, pulse on the rest of the industry and where everybody's kind of sitting. Um, so as of right now, uh, as you can see, I do have projections for everybody loaded so far. Um, now, these are the initial models for the broader industry. Obviously, we don't have confirmed lineups or anything just yet, so we don't know who's quite going to start. Uh, we do know who is starting 
on the mound for everybody, so that's a good place to start. Um, and so what I'll do throughout the, the most of the season here is try and bounce back between uh, this page here where I've just got broad pitcher projections. Um, this is really where I think we want to start most of our analysis, uh, and then we can filter down into the hitters and, and the ownership and, and all that sort of stuff uh, after we kind of get our bearings as to who's on the mound and who we want to attack uh, on a daily basis. So um, so that said, we can just kind of, I guess, go briefly over uh, early season MLB strategy um, and, and how that will differ from mid-season, you know, in the middle of the summer and, and later season sort of strategy uh, when we've got data on literally everybody. Um, what I like to do in the early part of the season is, I mean, first of all, from a data perspective, um, we're going to be using, I mean, obviously we don't have anything from this year, so this is all 2022 s statistics, as we can see right here, um, and, and we've got everything <laughs> that, that you can possibly imagine. So I will, I will go through a lot of this stuff um, in general, just to kind of get our bearings and refresh our memory for all of these guys, where they ended last season, uh, who we used to attack, um, who we used to avoid, and who we used to use quite a bit. So we'll, we'll, we'll couple the uh, fundamental projections, certainly with the pitchers, um, and I think you guys will find that we'll end up getting pretty granular with it uh, as the season goes along, and we really dig into a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the particulars about all of these pitchers, their arsenals. We'll talk about pitches. Uh, we'll talk about location. We'll talk about release points. Um, you know, baseball is really my gig, so um, there's a, a ton of data that we can utilize to try and gain an edge here. And when we couple that with the uh, industry aggregate projections of ownership and fantasy points, uh, hopefully that can really steer us in the right direction to building quality teams, and uh, and hopefully we can make some money. So um, that said, let's just kind of get into it. We'll just briefly go over kind of where we are uh, with pitchers, right? Um, so certainly for the early part of the season, first week or two even, uh, you'll see most of the aces on the mound, uh, and everybody's usually pretty healthy, right? So coming into the year, they've had a six-month off season. Uh, a lot of guys have really they they played in the WBC this year, so they're pretty tuned up. Um, that that that's more so goes for hitters, I would say, since pitchers were kind of on uh, on pitch count restrictions uh, in the w, WBC. Um, that said, in the early part of the the year, namely the first couple of weeks, uh, it's usually pretty difficult to get a whole hell of a lot of offense uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've got good arms, healthy arms, on the mound, usually. Uh, number two, it's obviously cooler weather uh, across North America uh, in the early part of the season, right? We're, we're just in late March right now, and, um, you know, there's, there's places that are still in the the mid 30s and, and low 40s in terms of temperature. So um, how that shakes out for tomorrow in particular, um, not a lot of weather models live quite yet, at least as they pertain to uh, to sports and DFS. Uh, of course, we can go check the weather. That will be all live tomorrow, um, but with an early slate, we probably won't go too much into weather, but I would like to... Uh, just sort of express in the early part of the year, um, if you can get to some warm weather games wh or games where weather and colder weather will not be a concern, that's definitely something you want to target uh, instead of relying just on statistics. Oh, well, this guy's a gas can. Well, if he's throwing a 38 degree weather, um, probably not on average going to see as much offensive upside from the uh, other team as you would, you know, if you were throwing in 95 degree weather. So something to keep in mind as far as that goes in the early part of the year, that'll probably persist a good bit of the way through April until we get into May. 
uh, and temperatures start uh, warming up pretty broadly across the league. So that said, um, price-wise for a lot of these aces, up top, uh, we do have, of course, DeGrom, Scherzer, Garrett, Cole, Corbin Burns, and the sire young winner in the NL last year, Sandy Alcantara, um, Aaron Nola on the mound, Max Fried had a killer season last year, Alec Manoa is very serviceable as well, uh, and certainly Blake Snell, Shane McClanahan. Um, these guys are all aces for their uh, of their respective staffs, including Logan Webb, Pablo Lopez in a new environment in Minnesota. So some guys have changed teams, but for the most part, uh, we we kind of know who they are. For pitchers, we have a lot of data, and they're generally far easier to project than hitters who only get you know four ABs a day. Um, so that said, the the guys up top, uh, we we're gonna see far higher prices on every one of these guys throughout the season. Um, so that's really the first thing that should jump out to us. It, our our pricing for a Jacob DeGrom at 9600 this is normally a smash play, right? Um, same thing with Scherzer, 9400 Garrett Cole at 9 k flat. Um, I mean, DeGrom's got a 42% strikeout rate from or, that he's bringing into, into this year uh, into a new environment. But, I mean, 42% is 42%. Same with Scherzer, same with Cole, uh, Corbin Burns as well. Very elevated strikeout numbers. So these prices um, are overall pretty cheap. And if we could get them at these price tags, I, we'd love to do it as often as we can. The one thing we need to caution ourselves with early in the season uh, is these guys are likely to be on pitch counts. I know for certain that Jacob deGrom is, is going to be limited to about 85 pitches. Um and some of the other aces as well, if they're not fully up to speed, they really don't get a, a ton of work throughout the spring. Uh, even guys like Max Fried, who had an excellent spring for Atlanta, he only threw about 11 innings. So uh, they they really take it easy on these guys, especially the horses like Aaron Nola, Sandy Alcantara, that are going to throw upwards of 200 innings per season. They really try to take it easy on them and keep them healthy and not rush them uh, into throwing, you know, 95, 105 pitches or whatever in the in their first couple of starts of the season, even though they've been working for, um, you know, going on a month now, down in Florida or Arizona. So that's really the only thing that we need to be cognizant of when we're just like insta clicking, um, you know, a 9K Garrett Cole. It, it's pitch counts. Now, they're still going to be stretched out. They're still starters, and they still have enough stuff to blast through these price tags in terms of raw value. Jacob deGrom, even at 85 pitches, uh, he could strike out 12 in six innings. Um, at And at 9,600, like, you, you don't really care. So uh, I think there's so, definitely some value that we can squeeze out of these upper sort of echelon um starters but we do need to be cognizant um at least keep it in the back of our mind that uh, some of these guys may be limited and they might not be performing or be able to throw as many pitches as they will you know when we get into the heart of the summer uh for example aaron nola had he threw like 95 pitches per start last season probably a little aggressive to assume that just out of the gate um, so keep that in mind for all of these guys, especially when we're eating ownership. Uh, certainly Garrett Cole, Corbin Burns up here, and Shane McClanahan leading the way in the ownership department so far. Now these numbers will adjust as models and lineups come in early tomorrow morning. We'll definitely have updates, but um, we want to be careful about eating very chalk, eating a lot of chalk on on pitchers early in the season, even though uh, there's still a lot of upside. So oftentimes what you'll find in the early parts of the year is you can find other guys that are still aces, right? Miles Michael is one of the aces um, in the NL Central. He certainly got upside at 7,400. Do we want to target him? Well, projection models don't really like him so far. Uh, certainly not going to be played by the rest of the field. Um, but guys like Hunter Green that have incredible strikeout upside will be owned a little bit more, uh, but maybe we can 
drop down a little bit from something like a Shane McClanahan if we don't want to eat a full 30% on a starting pitcher if we have pitch count concerns, for example. Now, not saying that we do necessarily for McClanahan, but um, he did drop off a little bit at the end of last year. He was really in the running to uh, win the AL Cy Young pretty handily uh, and then struggled for a little bit. So some things to keep in mind for these guys um, as we kind of get rolling again and and get into the uh, the full swing of the MLB season. Um, guys like Marcus Stroman, he's going to be uh, a very strong piece for the Cubs starting staff. We've always had strikeout worries when we're playing Stroman, but on a day like uh, a day like this, you can consider making a an ownership pivot to get to maybe a more chalky stack because we would like to target the the offenses that are in very good spots, namely the Twins against Zach Greinke, obviously Atlanta against Patrick Corbin. Uh, we could probably consider a little bit of a you know Boston against some Kyle Gibson, maybe some San Diego against Herman Marquez, who struggled mightily last season. Uh, but I think we can also get to some contrarian stacks. But as far as getting to chalky stacks, uh, I think that's a still an okay play, something we probably want to avoid in the broader part of the season. But earlier in the year, since there are good arms everywhere, it's, it's hard to target these guys. Um, even though they may be on pitch counts or something, I don't really want to go after Corbin Burns. Uh, or Aaron Nola, uh, or Max Freed necessarily, you know what I mean? Like, Max Scherzer, even though I might not play him, I, that, that doesn't mean I want to go stack the, the freaking Marlins here, uh, or stack Philly against DeGrom. Um, so, unfortunately, in the early part of the season, certainly in the first week when all these aces are going, uh, it's still hard to yeah you know, we're kind of hard pressed to find a lot of value in stacks so that means if we do get somebody that r struggled so badly last season like a Patrick Corbin for example um or even a Herman Marquez Zach Grinky who only throws about 46 miles an hour anymore um we probably want to consider uh really targeting these guys and eating the chalk on some of the hitters and then perhaps differentiating with a little bit of the pitching. So I know that was a long-winded way of saying that we could get off of Shane McClanahan and drop to 100 green if you want to. Um, but there are some some other really, really good arms and, and perhaps are not in the best spot, like a Sandy Alcantara against the Mets. But at 6%, he absolutely still has upside. We were paying 11000 11, for Sandy last season. Um even in bad matchups. So every one of these guys has upside to blow through these prices where I think most of the value lies is really just kind of in this mid-range here with the Aaron Nola, Max Freed, Blake Snell, McClanahan type of guys rather than the upper echelon, even though these guys, DeGrom, Scherzer, Cole, Corbin Burns, Sandy as well, really saw, compared to their... Uh, price tags in the previous season a bit more of a percentage drop um, so I think most of the value fundamentally and price wise is probably just going to be in this mid range here and that leads me to some particular constructions and uh, unsurprisingly I suppose uh, those are some of the chalkier stacks so um we can make some interesting pivots here in this range. Alec Manoa, probably not going to be one of them. A really bad strikeout matchup. Uh, and a lot of St. Louis is, uh, their lineup, um, you know, is really in the, you know, kind of mid-season form here. A good good bit of them played in the WBC. Um, Alec Manoa, generally not a guy we want to target for heavy strikeout numbers, certainly when there's all of these other guys on the slate ahead of him. So probably not um, a, a terribly equitable pivot off of some of these other really chalky guys to get to Manoa, but absolutely still playable. You know, he's still the effective ace of the staff um, in Toronto, and he's getting an open day, opening day start, so that definitely says something. 
and something that we can consider. If we're playing a bunch of teams, I would like to be spreading ownership all throughout a bunch of these guys, really not getting too heavy on any one pitcher that is overly chalky, like a Garrett Cole or a Corbin Burns or Shane McClanahan, because all of these guys have upside. Um, so what we I think want to probably do is, is consider something like a, like an like an Erod. Now um, there are definitely spots like in this Detroit Tampa game where we could play both sides like an Erod. You could stack maybe some mini stacks of Tampa uh, against Erod. Erod strikeout numbers dipped a little bit toward the end of last season uh, after he came back from injury. So. Um, I think there could be a little bit of sneaky value on Tampa as an unknown stack. If you do want to eat some of this ownership on a Cole Burns McClanahan type of play, uh, I think that's fine. Um, as far as a, a lot of these other guys, though, like I mentioned, it, it's pretty difficult to like want to go out of your way to target them. Um, we'll get into, I guess we could kind of switch over here. Uh, Corey Kluber pitched to a lot of contact last season. He gets the Orioles here. Corey Kluber, obviously, in uh, a new environment with the Red Sox here. But the issue that we run into when stacking the Orioles is their projected lineup here uh, is very, very expensive. Cedric, I love, 5,400 on opening day, probably not so much in what's likely to be cooler weather in Boston. I really, really like that Adley Rushman coming into the season as well. But at 5,000, a bit stiff for a catcher who's probably not going to be... Um, he'll be a bit more of a contact sort of bat rather than a raw power bat. And at 5,000, uh, it's generally what we, we want. We want to squeeze some power out of it. Same thing with Ryan Mountcastle. Um, 4,800, probably an elevated price tag for him. Santander had a killer WBC. Uh, would be very willing to pay this price for him. In the future, uh, at, at some points of the season, um, so a very intriguing lineup on day one. Do we really want to be paying these sorts of price tags to be targeting uh, a Corey Kluber? It, it's okay. It's going to be a contrarian stack for sure, um, but something we want to keep in mind. Uh, what we really want to target in the earlier parts of the season are, are just raw value. Very clear mispricings, uh, even in for for guys that may be in in poor spots. Um, a really good example here is my, Michael Conforto at three thousand flat. Uh, he gets Garrett Cole, who has a homer problem at Yankee Stadium, and even if it's fifty two degrees at Yankee Stadium, uh, it's still the size of a high school field. And Michael Conforto, I think at three thousand, really good value there. Now, do we want to stack against Garrett Cole? Not necessarily, but if we need some one-off value, I think we can consider a couple of the lefties from the Giants over here to include into our deeper tournament pools. Um, probably not a raw single entry type of play, but um, you know, certainly in in deeper stuff. Uh, obviously, if we're if we're targeting just the best stacks of the day, it's going to be Atlanta. Um, there's a couple of guys here that are very clearly mispriced for the potential upside that they bring. Number one being Austin Riley. He is uh, he's going to be very popular as of right now. We're only showing, I, I believe, um, about 10, 12 percent on him. Um, let's see where we are. And we're loading, we're loading, we're loading. Uh, we're stuck. There we go. Austin Riley. Okay, it's about 16%. Um, so this is probably going to steam a little bit. We'll have to keep an eye on the ownership numbers uh, for the Braves here. They're they're almost definitely going to steam as people really start building teams going into tomorrow. Uh, Acuna going to be very popular pretty much every every slate this season with the new stolen base rules. At 5,700, I think you're going to see a lot of guys like Acuna, that like a Trey Turner, for example, that will steal. Um I think you're going to see them well over 6,000 for the majority of the year. Sean Murphy uh, came over to Atlanta in a trade with the Athletics, and at 3,400, he's probably the most underpriced catcher play of the day. I think this is a very, very clear catcher value. So we can certainly get to some righties against Patrick Corbin for Atlanta. You can play some Ozzie Albies, 3,900. We were paying 5,500 for Albies a little, at, at some points um, last season before he got hurt. 
and the season before for sure. So um, at sub 10% ownership, if this holds for the Braves, I think it is going to be a, a really uh, valuable stack. You can get to some of the, the cheaper pieces down here as well. Uh, Marcelo Zuna. Um, now, Labs over here has Osuna projected in the five hole. He's kind of an autoplay uh, if you're stacking the Braves. Uh, and certainly in, as, as a one-off, um, if at this price, 2900 against Corbin, um, if he is in the five hole. Now, we'll see what they do with lineups when they come out uh, early tomorrow morning. So keep an eye on all of that stuff. But um, Braves certainly a, a stack that we can target going into... Uh, Washington against Patrick Corbin, who struggled mightily last year. He has by far the worst numbers of anybody going on the slate. So um, now, do we just want to like clown around and, and go 100% Braves here? Uh, probably not, um, because as I said, they're, these guys are still the aces of their respective staffs. And Patrick Corbin, while he did struggle, um, we can oftentimes look for an opportunity to sort of fade that narrative uh, going into the early part of the year when guys are a little bit more healthy and they've had six months worth of off season to work on any holes that they may have had in the previous year. So uh, something to keep in mind, there is downside to just um, clicking in every single one of the Braves at 15% ownership on a full 11 game slate on opening day. So, that said, um, another interesting uh, sort of stack that you could consider would be the Brewers. Uh, Marcus Stroman, if you do want to go after a high ground ball pitcher, it's guys, it's with lefties, and it's uh, with guys that can get a, get the ball in the air. Now, Jesse Winker has come over from the Mariners uh, back in the NL Central. Uh, he's had a pretty good spring. He looks comfortable. He looks healthy now. Uh, did not have a very good sort of tenure in in Seattle. Uh, that's mostly because, well, A, he didn't want to be there. He was not happy that he was traded from Cincinnati. Um, but more so, he didn't have a good time there because he was unhealthy. Uh, he was hurt. He had back problems. I believe he had wrist problems as well. Uh, he looks healthy here in the spring. S swing looks good. Um, and, and I think... Back being back in the NL Central against pitching that he is comfortable with, uh, I think you should probably see a pretty decent resurgence for a guy like Jesse Winker, who can get the ball in the air for sure, uh, and that's really what we want to target against a heavy ground ball pitcher like Marcus Stroman. Um, other guys like Roddy Telez, 3800 very reasonable price tag here. Makes it a little bit more palatable to get to a Christian Yelich at 4800 Now, Yelich has struggled since his MVP days, um, and the price tag is elevated given the results of the last two seasons for him. But if we do want to get to a little bit of a contrarian stack, uh, I think we can consider the Brewers as well against a Stroman. Uh, we talked already about the Orioles uh, uh, against Kluber. You can get to the other side and play a little bit of Boston as well. Now, I think overall Boston's probably going to be uh, a pretty weak lineup this season. Um, they've got Justin Turner, who is on the very back end of his career here. Alex Verdugo, just not a ton of upside in general. Uh, really excited to play the slugger of Masataka Yoshida coming over from Japan. Um, and really excited to get into a little um, of, the, of the of the weeds, I suppose, for a lot of the guys that... Uh, you know, are, are perhaps coming up from the minor leagues, guys like um, perhaps a, oh, I don't have a good example. Um, off the top of my head, maybe some guys like from, from the Royals, for example. They came up last year, had some good good outings, but really looking to take the, the next step, like a Michael Massey, um, you know, a Vinny who had an excellent year. Some of the guys from the Reds, um, TJ Friedel, maybe a Spencer Steer to continue their, their good outings uh, from last season. Uh, who else? Uh, maybe some sneaky Colorado value. They've got Ezekiel Tovar, uh, Eller Reese Montero, um, Jerry Profar. Uh, he's not a new face necessarily, but uh, one of these guys that has kind of changed teams 
and is in a new environment may provide us a little bit of value in that regard as well. Um, in particular, like a, a Jordan Walker, right? A uh, very young top prospect for the Cardinals. So really excited to get into the weeds with a lot of these guys. But overall, I think Boston is probably going to have a generally pretty weak lineup. So whenever we can get them against a guy that has a lot of variance with him in Kyle Gibson uh, and not a whole lot of upside, I think this is a reasonable target as well. Rafi Devers here at 5,900, pretty stiff at the beginning part of the year, but um, one of the best hitters in the American League. So we can definitely target this. And I think the price tags here, um, certainly with a guy like Tristan Casas, who had an excellent debut last season, first base, 2,900, they they make getting to a, a 5,900 Rafi Devers a little bit more palatable. So um, we can consider some Boston as well. Uh, we'd have to keep an eye again once it, you know, uh, on the weather in Boston. If it's 35 degrees, probably just stay away from it. Um, some other interesting spots. Uh, really don't want to deal with any of the the hitters down here uh, in the Philly Texas game. Of course, um, prices are too high. Number one, and they get Degrom and Nola respectively. I'd rather just play Nola over here. You can even play some Degrom if his ownership stays uh, relatively flattened, as we're seeing in the early going here. Um, McClanahan, of course, going to basically lead the way. Uh, he's too cheap, number one, and the upside is too high for him in this matchup against Detroit. Detroit really hasn't done much as far as their, uh, you know, offseason acquisitions or improving their lineup. Um, and this basically looks like the exact same lineup last year that struck out at a solid 26% clip uh, against lefties, I believe. So. Uh, Shane McClanahan in an excellent spot here. If you are going to eat somebody, uh, or to eat some chalk on somebody, I should say, uh, I think McClanahan is a very viable candidate. Uh, he, he's too cheap. He should be 9,700 um, in the it's certainly in this matchup for sure. Uh, but that said, there are a couple of guys on Detroit that have had some some decent springs, um, namely Spencer Torkelson. He's a cheap value piece here. If you do want to, in deep tournament teams, get off of some Shane McClanahan um, and, and and get some some hedges, if you will. Uh, I think a one-off Spencer Torkelson, 2300 is very valuable. He's had a killer spring. If the guy can cut down on his strikeout rate and improve the contact rate, um, I think that is a very viable consideration at first base uh, on opening day here. Um, so the other very popular stack I think we can talk about here is probably the Twins. They're going to be um, pretty popular, I would say, right in line with the Braves, at least in early projection runs. Um, They've got a little bit of a, a new look here at at the top. They are going to be leading off Joey Gallo. They've been doing it in the spring. Uh, not really sure why, but um, this is a good spot for him, and he's projecting as one of the the leading uh, position players in terms of raw projection and, and value score uh, of the entire slate. So at 3,100 against Zach Greinke, a guy that's not going to throw it by him, uh, I think is a pretty good value and naturally that's going to filter a lot of the field onto the rest of the twins because guys like Byron Buxton similar to Ronald Acuna has a boatload of power and will when he gets on base will steal uh, with the effectively shortened base paths uh, by way of a you know the larger bases um, this season guys like Byron Buxton should be able to squeeze out a good few more bases uh, stolen bases, that is. Um, some other guys that we can target. You can play righties against Granky. You can play lefties. He he doesn't throw that hard anymore. He's not going to throw it by anybody, as I mentioned. So you can play Josie Miranda. You can play Kepler. You can play Trevor Larnick. Uh, all of these guys make getting to the Correas, who you'd probably want to play, and the Byron Buxton, who you certainly want to play, a little bit more palatable as well. Uh, Christian Vasquez behind the plate. He's an interesting catcher play. Uh, perfectly fine to throw him in at 3,200 also. Had a bit of a down season last year in terms of uh, offensive production, but uh, is still very capable in this particular matchup. Nick Gordon you can play as well, and Michael Taylor. 
Uh, he has always hit lefties a little bit better than righties, but um, Granky is effectively a neutral split here, and since he's not going to throw it by Michael Taylor, uh, which is really his main weakness, swing and miss, at 2700 if you need a sort of wraparound filler piece, uh, you can consider that as well. So definitely ways to get to the Twins and get a little bit more contrarian with it. Um, if you are stacking against Granky, and you're not going to be the only one, so keep that in mind. Uh, if you do want to get a little contrarian with it, you can play the other side of the game. I, I like doing this a lot. Uh, just playing the other side when it's viable um, of a very popular stack. Just get to the Royals over here. They've looked excellent in the spring. A lot of these young guys, uh, in addition to uh, Salvi here, who is back healthy, um, they, they look really, really strong. Bobby Witt didn't get a ton of playing time in the WBC, but he has immense upside, and he's one of the fastest guys in the league. So at 5,200, um, the price looks a little elevated in general, but the fundamentals of DFS scoring this season have changed markedly because of the very likely increase in stolen base uh, upside for a lot of these players. So um, MJ is not going to steal bases, but he's still a, a, a catcher play leading off. Um with dual eligibility. So you can definitely get to him if you're stacking some of the Royals. Pablo certainly has vulnerabilities against the left side of the plate. Uh, and we discussed briefly Vinny Pascantino at 4,000. I think he's a pretty damn good value play here uh, at first base. First base is going to be pretty deep, certainly on an 11-game slate, and definitely with everybody healthy on, on opening day. Uh, Michael Massey, another really strong Second base play at 2,800 here makes getting to Salvi and a Bobby Witt, even an MJ, a little bit more palatable. Um, and at 2,800, Michael Massey is a, a top prospect for the Royals. He should be their starting second baseman all season now that, um, I mean, Witt was traded uh, mid last year. So, um, he, did, he, he was mostly in the outfield anyway, but Michael Massey should be the, the, full-time first baseman uh, there every day for the Royals here. So um, Hunter Dozier still has plenty of power, probably not the best matchup for him against Pablo. So I'd mostly like to get to some of the lefties here and probably, uh, I mean, definitely you can include Salvi, but this isn't a contrarian stack that you can consider also. Uh, don't really want to be playing the Mets really or the Marlins. Uh, I have too much respect for Sandy and Scherzer. And this is in Miami. The ballpark's big. And it's still, even after moving the fences and suppresses runs. So not something I'm really uh, super ecstatic about going after. Um, I would much rather just get to pitching rather than offense in Miami. Uh, Pirates and, and the Reds here, this is an interesting game. We talked briefly about Hunter Green, 7,400. I think this is a, a decent value piece on the mound that you could consider getting to. Uh, would be... A little bit careful because there's some guys um, that they have inserted into the lineup that don't strike out. And that's uh, that's Jimin Choi, that's Carlos Santana, that's Andrew McCutcheon. Um, O'Neill Cruz against righties is a killer play. Uh, nobody's going to be playing him because he's generally pretty overpriced at 5,100. But he has fantastic numbers against righties. Uh and Brian Reynolds at 5,200, probably a little elevated for him as well. But he's going to be auditioning. Uh, he asked for a trade in the offseason, and the Pirates just kind of stonewalled him. So um, the he'll be auditioning for other teams, uh, and he expect a, a pretty good first half out of Brian Reynolds uh, and definitely expect the Pirates to eventually unload him. But um, I would not really be crazy about going after Hunter Green. Um Hunter's initial issues, we can kind of get to him here briefly. Uh, in the big leagues, let's see, where is he? Uh, down here. Um, was a little bit of hard contact and staying on the barrel, okay? Um, he definitely has a, a killer strikeout rate at 31% nearly. Throws strike one, but a little bit of susceptibility to putting runners on base with a 9% walk rate. The 14.5% 4, swinging strike rate uh, is one of the better numbers in the league. So there's obviously swing and miss that you can target 
with Hunter Green here, and at 7,400, there's there's definitely upside. At 16% projected ownership at the moment, I think this is a, a good play down in the lower mid-range. You probably don't want to dip down much lower than this. So that may spike his ownership uh, as we get in to tomorrow. But at at these raw numbers right here, um, the, the matchup... Uh, against Pittsburgh is is pretty respectable. Last season, they struck out at a 25% clip, nearly just created at about an 86 per, or an 86 WRC plus. Um, didn't hit for any power, right? And a a WOBA sub 300 at, at just 291. So an overall pretty weak lineup in general for the Pirates uh, last season, but. Once again, you're going to have O'Neill Cruz, Brian Reynolds, and a still viable hitter in Andrew McCutcheon, guy that never strikes out. Carlos Santana walks a crap load. Um, and actually, toward the end of the year, had a bit of a resurgence power-wise. Jimin Choi they brought over from Tampa as well. All that, and C Brian Hayes we haven't even mentioned yet. Certainly power here also. Um, so that would be where I'd be concerned with Hunter Green and, and clicking in 75% of him or something crazy like that. Uh, but there's definitely strikeouts here from a couple of these guys, and he can certainly uh, pay off this price tag at 7400 So an interesting, um, interesting game, excuse me, down here with uh, getting to the Reds. Now, on the other side, Mitch Keller. I generally don't like targeting Mitch Keller. Um, I respect the kid, even though he's got he a, a about a 20% strikeout rate. His problem has really always been getting ahead of hitters and throwing strike one. The walks, they are coming down um, to his, I think it was like 13 14% walk rate uh, when they first brought him up a couple of seasons ago. But the ERA... And expected metrics are are still a little elevated. Buck 40 whip, it's not nothing. Um, so there's still a little bit of susceptibility here for Mitch Keller. And with a, a depressed strikeout rate of just 20%, um, I think it's going to be we're going to be hard pressed to find a ton of value even at 6,700. He'll probably be hovering in this price range most of the season. Um, it could be a little depressed for him, and there's definitely upside. Uh, against a an overall hapless Reds lineup, but once again, it's early part of the year, and there's going to be a, a good bit of variance um, compared to last season's numbers uh, at in the first couple weeks of the season. So uh, he pitches to a lot of contact. Does Keller stays off the barrel, and most of the contact isn't very hard because he's got a buck seventy two ground ball to fly ball rate right here. Doesn't give up homers, so this is generally why I don't like targeting him. Um, but he will pitch to contact, 276 average allowed to lefties last season, 257 to righties, but deep, depressed ISO numbers, um, and he, he is markedly better against the right side of the plate in terms of raw strikeouts at a 23%. So uh, unfortunately, the Reds do have some lefties in, in the list, um, even though they are going to be missing Joey Votto. They do have Tyler Stevenson back healthy this season, but... Uh, in terms of lefties, T.J. Friedel, Jake Fraley, um, and they do have a, a Will Benson and a Jason Vossler down here. So they can mix it up a little bit and be a little bit sticky. So I'm not overly crazy about playing some Mitch Keller or really getting to the Reds at some elevated price tags for guys that are not necessarily in the best spot. We talked about Alec Manoa. Uh, it doesn't mean I, I, if I, since I don't want to play him, it doesn't really mean I don't want to uh, target him uh, with the Cardinals necessarily either. Uh, these price tags, certainly on Goldschmidt and Arenado, um, you know, they're probably depressed for where they will be later in the season. Not crazy about going after Manoa. He's, he's a really good arm, a very solid arm, and the Cardinals, they don't strike out a lot. So I'm not playing him, um, but really not a ton of value here, I think, in the early part of the year of, of playing um, even a an admittedly good lineup against a pretty good arm. Uh, one value that does stick out to me here would be Brendan Donovan. He's had a pretty good spring. Looks really, really strong. I think he's going to take the next step this season. Um, and at 3,600 leading off, if they do lead him off instead of Tommy Edmond, I think this is a pretty decent one-off second, third base play. Uh, Multi-eligibility, or multi-position eligibility, rather, um, that you could consider throwing into some into some deeper tournament stuff. Once again, not a 
uh, a single entry play necessarily, but um, it's very well possible if you're looking for some value in these later games. Um, Toronto, I really don't want to target Michaelis either. Um, we can get to him and his numbers here quickly as well. Now, last season, um, Michaelis, uh, you know, he had a pretty good year. He was up and down. He got blown up a couple of times. Um, but in the early part of the year, he went on a, a streak of, I think, 25 or 30 plus point DK um, or DK point fantasy games rather. Um, and there's some value out of him. He, he's a, he's a good arm. He's got pretty good stuff. Uh, later when we have more time and we get more familiar with the pitching, uh, we'll start going into all of the, the pitch counts and, and doing some more analysis, uh, on that. But suffice to say that he's got three pretty plus pitches here in the four seamer, the two seamer, and the slider does throw the curveball and use it a good bit as well. Uh, the changeup needs work, but doesn't really use it a lot. So he's got, he's got some breaking stuff really where he's vulnerable is the off speed. Now, uh, with Toronto, uh, they're still a pretty young lineup, but man, they, they're very, very dangerous. So you could consider playing a contrarian, uh, Toronto stack here. Now the price tags on them, uh, definitely high. We know Dalton Varsho has been taken, uh, he has steamed quite a bit in season-long leagues, certainly in DFS at 3,800. Um, like, he hits the ball in the air, right? And Michaelis has a buck 30 ground ball to fly ball. Against lefties, he's got a slightly higher ground ball rate. So guys that will get the ball in the air and can hit for a little bit of power, Michaelis yields the 157 ISO here, just a 20% strikeout rate against the left side. We can consider targeting them for sure. Get rid of the Fanduel. Um, so I think this is one of the best value plays uh, in the outfield of the day. Um, have to be aware of weather and generally because uh, Bush Stadium does suppress a lot of offense. Uh, but this is a pretty decent spot for da for Dalton Varsho as he gets the ball in the air pretty regularly. Um, Brandon Belt, also a new face over here at 2,800. We'll have to see if he is going to be healthy. He's one of these types of players early in the season that I like uh, targeting. Um, certainly at a cheap price tag because it, he's had six months to, to try and get healthy. So um, hopefully he doesn't get hurt again. But in the event that he does, uh, we're probably going to want to try and take advantage of the, the depressed price here. Unfortunately, he's once again only eligible at first base. And as we've seen, a lot of first base plays that we can get to um, and a cheap price tag. So probably not something I'd go out of my way to target, but would certainly keep him in the pool and deeper tournament stuff. So um, not crazy about stacking the Blue Jays here, but you could do like a, a two-man or a three-man um, throw in Bichette. You could throw in Vladdy for sure. You could play him against everybody. Um I think this is an okay contrarian kind of off the board stack to to consider with with Toronto. Uh, and quickly, I guess we'll just go over the last game since I've been kind of rambling here. Um, Herman Marquez and Blake Snell for the Rockies and the Padres respectively. Like Blake Snell Snell here a lot at 7,900. Rockies they're still going to strike out a crap load this season. Um, for example, uh, a few days ago in Shane Bieber's final start of the spring. Uh, he only threw about 85 pitches, I think, and he got them for 11 Ks in like six and two thirds or, or seven and a third or something like that. So um, they're going to strike out a lot this season. And their lineup basically looks unchanged for the most part from last year. So they do, of course, we talked about Jerry Profar that they're going to have up top. Um, so this will give them a little bit more versatility. But that, I mean, Blake Snell is still most likely going to win this matchup pretty handily. Uh, Chris Bryant will strike out a little bit. He does look healthy, so hopefully he can stay on the field this season. But Charlie Blackman's kind of getting up there. Um, doesn't really strike out a, a ton, uh, usually. Um, but the they're, the Rockies right now, we really like targeting them when, you know, deeper in the season, when they're really in the throes of all of the travel starting to wear on them. This season... Uh, I mean, obviously, we're at the early part of the year. They've been down in Arizona forever, and, you know, the, the, the travel woes are really not going to plague them 
uh, most often in the early parts of the year. So still targetable, definitely with Blake Snell. Uh, really like the price tag. If you want to pivot off of a Shane McClanahan at 77, get to some Snell at 79, uh, I think that's perfectly fine. You can play them both. Um, they project well, and this is a one of the better spots of the day for a very good arm. Also keep in mind that, that Blake Snell does have uh, some walk problems. So if you do have a lot of Snell, consider hedging with some Rocky stacks on the other side. Uh, certainly with some Chris Bryant, you can play Jerry Profar at 36. Good value piece here, switch hitting, leading off, um, if he does lead off. C.J. Crone, obviously plenty of power, has, an okay, has had an okay spring so far, 4,600. This is fine as well. Um, very, very off-the-board stack here with the Rockies, but something that, that you can keep in mind. Um, on the other side, I don't particularly want to be targeting Herman Marquez, but that doesn't mean you can't with the with the Padres here. Now that they've got uh, Bogarts that they added to the lineup, they also have a Matt Carpenter. Um, when Tostis gets back, this is probably the best lineup in baseball, um, right up there with the Phillies. Um, these guys are going to be very, very difficult to navigate all season. So I'm not playing Marquez for sure. He struggled a lot last year. Uh, and was very flat with the fastball, very flat with the slider. And he, he, he piped a lot of stuff, so he got beat up pretty good. Um, but coming into this season, I think he's he's definitely worked on some stuff in the off season. We'll talk about that more as the season goes along. But um, not something I, I mean, against this lineup, this lineup's not going to strike out. They're probably going to have one of the best strikeout rates um, in baseball. So Marquez naturally not a heavy strikeout pitcher uh, or as much so as he was earlier earlier in his career so probably not something we want to go after here um, that said you can play some Padre stacks if you'd like uh, it's it's gonna be difficult to get to all of them um, you're gonna have to throw in a, a cheap Matt Carpenter type of play if he if he's in the list um, that will make it more palatable to get to Bogart Soto Machado Cronenworth I like at 4,500. He's probably a little elevated for him. Probably not going to steal a lot. But guys like Juan Soto, um, Hasung Kim, he's got stolen base upside. Trent Grisham might steal a bag or two. Uh, certainly Jose Azokar if you need to make it really cheap. So Padres again um, in line for a stack that you can consider, but not something I'll, I'll necessarily go out of my way to target. So I know that's kind of, um, we jumped around quite a bit here, uh, but that should give you guys an idea as to how I like to approach the early part of the season uh, in baseball and should give you guys an idea of some particular pitchers to target. Uh, once again, I'll have the projections. Hopefully we'll have them up um, today for mine, but uh, nevertheless, she should should have his projections up, kind of get give you guys an idea as to where to start. Um, but Here's where we're, we're sitting right now. Uh, obviously, Cole, Burns, uh, Snell, McClanahan are going to be the chalk arms. And then everybody else you can just kind of sprinkle in. So I think there's some cool decisions that you can make. Try to get a little contrarian uh, on the mound. And you can just play some of the good stacks and good values. I think that's a, a pretty viable construction uh, going into opening day. Um and that's generally how I like to approach things early in the season uh, when when we're coming off a long off season and guys have had time to get healthy um, and work on some stuff. So that's really where we stand so far, guys. Um, keep an eye out for the projections. I'll update in the Discord. And um, maybe tomorrow morning might might push a, a last minute video when we start to get a little a little bit more info. But um, for the most part, that's probably it for me. We'll, we'll be a little bit more structured uh, for the videos going forward. We'll go through the matchups. We'll go through each each one of the pitchers, you know, a bit more in depth as we as we get toward uh, or kind of get our our legs under us a little bit. But um, you know, for now, uh, that's probably where I'll leave it. Um, you know, if we uh, if we don't talk again before tomorrow, check out uh, Sheets and Bobby. They'll have videos up. And uh, once again, keep an eye out for their projections. So uh, good luck, everybody. Let's um, let's let's get it this baseball season.